Oh, well, people just wandered around like most of us do these days, only they didn't have clothes on. <laughs> and when we saw a person walking through the paddock, we just said, Ngai, there you go, and it means, and it means the same as welcome to country. I'll come from Puncari, where I've lived all my life, born there, seen the river dried out from bend to bend. There was only holes of water here and there. Walk along the bottom of the creek digging out yabbies with springs off old carts. We weren't allowed to take the shovel down because you know what kids are. They leave things behind. And we got, once you got the ya dug down the yabby holes, in down the bottom there used to be a big pool of water, about eight, nine or ten yabbies in it. And we used to get a great feed. And I love the river. Been there all my life, still there. And now I'm out here at Mungo, I like to welcome everybody that comes around and enjoy their stay here. Kandinura. Now, Kandinura means, in our language, a long, long time ago. And like the old Yunguli story, that means the black swan story. That, how did that go, Warren? Because of the greed of the people. Oh. Fond of the... Oh, this... What that was a gachi down this hole and this other wimp, but I mean black fella was gonna kill it and this other fella said, No, you're not gonna kill it because you're not gonna eat it. You only kill things you ate. So anyway he stuck his spear in this thing and this water hoosed up and then they both started running. Try to get away from the water and the water just kept coming and coming and they kept running and running. And then he saw this little bunyip sitting on a log and he grabbed that and took it with him. And the other bloke said, don't touch it, leave it there. No, he took it and the water kept chasing them. And then when they got to the end of the thing and they couldn't run anymore, they were turned into two black swans. And that was a lesson that our kids was taught not to touch anything that they didn't eat. So that's how that story ended up. They turned into black swans. Oh, my old Uncle Phil, he passed on now years back. He built us a bark canoe out of the trees. You only can do that certain time of the year, get the bark off the tree. Other times it just sticks on and you can't get it off. So he knew when to do it, so he got us a bark canoe. And oh, it was great. We used it in a lot of the floodwaters with just a stick for oars, pushing along. And that was oh, one of the floodwaters. It was taken somewhere in the river now, I think. So we were really lucky having goats and horses and chooks and turkeys and whatever. We had all that when we was growing up, especially the goats. When I was old enough, I was learning to milk goats. It was a terrible thing. And it was great. The hand the horses we had and trying to break in horses. I mean, we was only kids, but we tried. <laughs> it was fun. We had a sledge my father made so the horse wouldn't back on us. Or it would back back, but it wouldn't break any shafts off the carts like it was doing. And we used to drive that around just standing up on this piece of wood, a forky tree almost. And to get to school was the most horrible life I ever had. The floodwaters came up and this, they cut a big tree down to lay across the creek. And that was our bridge. We'd walk across that. And then we found a tree that grew up here and another tree to get you down onto an island. We'd climb up this tree, it was shortcuts, see? 
climb up this tree, come down the next tree and get on this island and run across a log. No sides on it, just a long lane across the creek. We'd run across that and get to school. And nobody knew, and then someone come up with an idea. They built a swinging bridge with wire and sticks across it. And they laid that across the creek. And we used to walk across there, and I carried the bike across that, hanging onto the one wire and holding my bike. And that was good because it was a shortcut. That's how I got to school. I'd done it tough, but I was so happy when the water did come up and I couldn't go to school. <laughs> I was pleased about that, so I left school. Oh, I still know my language. I can move you this. White Belko, Wimbit Belko. I know you don't know what I said. You want to know? Yeah. <laughs> I can rass on you some natural language. <laughs> uh, I still understand my language and I'm glad I learnt. It wasn't easy because we weren't allowed to, my mum and her sisters weren't allowed to speak the language in town, in Pankeri, or they'd jail you, that said. So they never spoke in town while they were doing the shopping. They just walked down the road a bit and started talking on their way home. And so I've never lost any of the language which I'm very proud to say. And, but it's hard to be able to talk to people who hardly know the language. My sister was good, but she passed away now. She knew all the language and we could talk it. I used to take her up to Wilcania. There was a lady up there. Well, what was her name? Lawson, wasn't it? Oh, and I used to love taking her there, and they'd just talk our language without a break, and I'd just sit there killing myself laughing because I talked about Punkeri, and it was great to hear them talk our language without English, and they were good at it, and I loved that. <laughs>